Prophecy is not, um, it's not a guess, it's not a forecast, it's not a calculation or a mere conjecture, it's not a vague generalization or even an educated analysis of a forthcoming situation. That means that prophecy is not like a weather forecast. Please don't call meteorologists prophets. They're not. They're wrong. A lot. Um, meteorologists, they might have lots of scientific training, but the weathermen still frequently fail to give the correct forecast. Some of you are walking in here wet today. When I looked at the Weather Channel four hours ago, it wasn't supposed to rain till 6 o'clock. They were wrong. Okay, it rained earlier than that. Sometimes it rains when they say it's not going to rain. Sometimes it's not raining um, when they say it's supposed to rain. Um, sometimes they're wrong. They're making predictions. Um, there have been plenty of studies of psychics and their predictions. Many of these predictions are vague and they're obscure, yet there's plenty of documented examples of specific predictions from psychics that have been just dead wrong. Uh, they're not prophets. Psychics are not prophets. The best financial advisors can offer educated guesses about the stock market and the financial markets and oil futures, but those predictions and those analysts can also be wrong. Um, sports analysts can make educated guesses after watching every ball game for the entire season, but, but none of those you know, educated guesses seem to lead to a perfect bracket for anybody when college basketball season comes, right? So as wise as they might be about predicting the future of games, sometimes they're wrong. They're not prophets. Um, this type of prediction is not on the same level as biblical prophecy. So biblical prophecy is not making a lot of predictions about the future and then having a few of them or even most of them come to pass. In biblical prophecy, Everything that has been predicted has come to pass. Now, with some prophecies, um, we do have to take into account that they were conditional prophecies. And the change of conditions may have affected the outcome of the prophecy. For example, Deuteronomy 28. Are you familiar with Deuteronomy 28 where it talks about, if you obey and do these things, then you will be blessed in the land. If you do not obey, then these will be the curses that come up on you in the land. This is a prophecy specifically to Israel, but whether or not the prophecy of blessings or curses came to pass depended upon the obedience or the disobedience of the people. Um, true prophecy, though, predictive prophecy is always 100% accurate. And so we want to spend some time thinking a little bit more about prophecy. Um, here's a definition of prophecy from McIlvain in his book, Evidences of Christianity. He says, prophecy is a declaration of future events such as no human wisdom or forecast is sufficient to make, depending on a knowledge of the innumerable contingencies of human affairs, which belongs exclusively to the omniscience of God, so that from its very nature, Prophecy must be divine revelation. Um, so there's kind of a textbook definition of prophecy. Um, let's think about prophecy as the word is used in its various forms in the Bible, though. Um, this is Justin Martyr, by the way, who says, To declare a thing shall come to be long before it's in being, and then to bring about that very thing according to the same declaration, this or nothing is the work of God. That's what prophecy is, to declare something is going to come to be, and it either does or um, does not, based upon what God has said. Um, now, we see three different you know, ways the word prof prophecy is used. You, you see a prophet, right? And that's the person who does prophesying, is a prophet in Scripture. Um, you see a prophecy, that is kind of the thing that has been foretold of some future event, and then to prophesy is the act of foretelling, which is what the prophet does. His job is to prophesy prophecies. So a prophet prophesies prophecies. You see how that word is used in three different ways? Right. Um, a prophet in Scripture did not just 
foretell events. A prophet was a forth teller. Um, and the prophet's job was to simply act as a spokesman for God. I want you to take a look at just some of these passages real quick. Exodus 7 and verse 1 says this. Um, remember, Moses didn't feel like he was capable of being God's spokesman for the people and um, didn't feel as though he was refined enough in his speech and his oratory. And so he says, you know, God, I'm not a good speaker. You need to find somebody else. And, and God says, well, I'll take care of that. And we'll make Aaron, your brother, the spokesman. Take a look at Exodus chapter 7, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you as God to Pharaoh, and Aaron, your brother, shall be your prophet. Okay? Shall be your prophet. The word prophet is used there in Exodus chapter 7 and verse 1. What was Aaron's job? Aaron was the spokesman uh, for Moses, who was the spokesman for God. And that's what a prophet did. Um, as Moses was as a god to Pharaoh, Aaron, his brother, was his prophet, his spokesman, or his mouth. Take a look at Exodus 4 and verse 16. Exodus 4 and verse 16 says, So he shall be your spokesman to the people. He himself shall be as a mouth for you, and you shall be to him as God. So what Moses said to Aaron, Aaron was to communicate to the people, and Aaron um, was a spokesman or also called a prophet in Scripture. Well, that's really what a prophet is. A prophet is given God's message, and he relays and communicates God's message to the audience that God wants him to relay and communicate it to. Some of the prophets prophesied of the northern kingdom, some prophesied of the southern kingdom in your Old Testament, some prophesied to all of um, all of Israel and Judah together. Um, uh, some prophets uh, were, were prophesying before the division of the kingdom, uh, but their job was to communicate God's message or God's standard. If you take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 18 and 19, you'll see the role of a prophet stated in this passage. It says in verse 18, I will raise up for them a prophet like you. That's Moses being spoken to, so there's going to be a prophet like Moses from among their brethren. And I will put my words in his mouth. What does a prophet do? Well, God takes his words, puts it in the prophet's mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. That's a prophet's job. God uses his words, puts it in the prophet's mouth, and the prophet communicates it to the people. So, uh, a prophet was not just someone who was predicting things. Um, not all of his words were predictions. And so I don't want you to think that every time you study a prophet or um, what we would call a prophecy, it's always predictive. But in our study, what we're going to study in our next few lessons um, are going to be the predictions of prophets, um, predictive prophecy. Um, and so we're going to notice a few times where uh, these predictions are made and see how they were fulfilled in history. Um, all right, what is the criteria of true prophecy? Uh, I want you to think a little bit about that. What makes, um, what, what makes a prophecy legitimate? So I want you to consider a few things that, that we might think about as we think about what makes uh, something a true prophecy. Well, one of the things that would make a prophecy legitimate is that it has to be beyond the power of man to foresee. Me telling you that you'll get home safely tonight, anybody could foresee that, right? Anybody could predict that. Um, the event has to be beyond the power of man to foresee. One example of that, we could look at a lot, might be Daniel's prophecies in Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7. Daniel prophesies about the defeat of Babylon. Well, that you might say, well, that's pretty easy because he was in Babylon when he made some of those prophecies. And so maybe he could predict that Medo-Persia was on the rise and Medo-Persia was going to defeat Babylon. One of the amazing things about Daniel's prophecies is he doesn't just predict that. He predicts also the fall of Medo-Persia by Greece, and then he predicts the fall of Greece by Rome. He predicts uh, four world empires over the course of centuries 
um, in his predictions of Dan in Daniel 2 and in Daniel chapter 7. Really, Daniel 7 through 11, he gets more specific about that. Um, this is beyond the power of man to foresee. This is something that is clearly very unique. Um, this isn't like predicting what Notre Dame's record is going to be this year, which I already know it's, it's gonna, there's going to be one loss in that column. Um, anybody could make a prediction like that, and you might just get lucky. Um, but Bible prophecy is beyond our power, our ability to foresee. It also has to be demonstrated that the prediction was written before the event. That's why dating, sometimes you might get bored a little bit with preachers and teachers talking about the dates when certain books were written, especially prophetic books, but the dates are very important because there are a lot of people who like to throw shade on um, passages of Scripture uh, by saying that those books were actually written um, after the events written in them were fulfilled. Why would they want to do that? They want to do that because they want to belittle the prophecies. They want to say some of the prophecies were written after um, the, the actual events happened, so they weren't prophecies after all. Um, that makes them histories, not prophecies. So dates are important, and it has to be demonstrated in biblical prophecy that the prophecy, uh, the thing foretold, was written before the event. It wouldn't make me a prophet, would it, if I told you that, that Ohio State beat Notre Dame last night because it already happened. Um, I'm just telling you what happened. Um, if we make the prediction post-event, it's not prophecy. The prediction also has to be applicable to the event, and the language of the prediction must be unambiguous and unmistakable. Okay? This is one of the things that makes Bible prophecy different than psychics and some of their predictions. You know, if I pulled out my crystal ball and pretended tonight that I was a psychic and began to rub it and have the dry ice going and got fog going over here, and I said to Hattie, I like to, oh, oh, I forgot to use Sam in my illustrations this morning, so we'll use him this evening. Um, but I said to Sam, Sam, you're going to be married someday. Ooh, well, I mean, there's a, there's a good chance I could have said that about any young person in here, right? That's a pretty ambiguous prophecy. Now, you want to get a little more specific about whether or not that's a legitimate prophecy, then what if I told Sam the name of the person he's going to marry? What if I gave him the date and the year when that was going to take place? And I actually named the place where the wedding was going to happen. Now we're getting more specific, and now the likelihood that I could have been doing that just on some guess when Sam has zero love interest in his life right now. <laughs> I had people come to me at the back door and say, you left Sam out to, to this morning, so I'm doing this for you, people. <laughs> you felt like Sam didn't get enough attention this morning, so here's the attention. Poor Sam. Everybody feels sorry for him. Everybody's thinking of like their cousins and their, their nieces that maybe they could hook Sam up with now, probably too. But now we're getting now we're getting more specific, right? So that makes the likelihood of it being legitimate prophecy more likely. Um, the prediction also has to have a clear and demonstrable fulfillment. So if I make those predictions about the person and the time and the place and the setting, it has to actually have happened, right? Um, and so the prediction has to be clearly and demonstrably fulfilled. Um, those are some of the criteria of true and legitimate prophecy that makes prophecy different than the work of, of psychics and fortune tellers and things like that today. Um, now, what's the power of prophecy? This is a syllogism that was used by Homer Haley. Homer, was, um, Homer Haley was a, a professor at Florida College for a while, um, writes some pretty good material. But this is a syllogism he used to prove the value of prophecy. And he says this, you know, man cannot know the future. It begins with this. Man cannot know the future. Only God can foretell history or events. Would you, would you agree with that? You know, man cannot know the future. 
Only God can foretell history or events. Second part of the syllogism is that the Bible foretold the destiny of nations and the coming of Christ. Okay, and we're, we're going to spend a lot of time in our future lessons about those specific prophecies. And therefore, the third, uh, the conclusion to those two premises is the Bible is the word of God, not man. Okay, that, that's the power of prophecy. Prophecy tells us that there is a God behind the word of God. Uh, there's a divine mind. Now, that argument is really the argument that you find in Scripture itself. So look at a couple of passages of Scripture with me. And this is in the book of Isaiah. Now, one of the big issues that Isaiah and Jeremiah dealt with was they were often dealing with the nation flirting with false gods and with idols and, and people who couldn't foretell things and make prophecies like the true prophets could. And one of the arguments that's being made here in Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 21 is uh, Isaiah is speaking for the Lord and says, Set forth your case, says the Lord. Bring your proofs, says the king of Jacob. Let them bring them and tell us what is to happen. They're basically speaking to the idol worshipers who are worshiping false gods. Go ahead and let, let your carvings tell us what is to happen. Let your false prophets tell us what is to happen. Tell us the former things, what they are, that we may consider them, that we may know their outcome. Declare to us the things to come. Tell us what is to come hereafter, that we may know that you are God's. One of the things that Isaiah and Jeremiah knew distinguished them as true prophets from the false prophets was that they were able to predict future events and those things would come to pass. And so here in this passage, they're saying, go ahead and do that. Do what we are able to do, and that is speak of things that are to come and let's see them actually take place. Do good or do harm that we may be dismayed and terrified. So Jehovah rests his claim to deity on his ability to tell the future and to cause the same to come to pass. Um, this takes place in the days when the northern kingdom of Israel was about to go into Assyrian captivity, and God is challenging their idols to declare the future. Look at another passage here from Isaiah 41 and verse 26. It says, Who declared it from the beginning that we might know, and beforehand that we might say, He is right. There was none who declared it, none who proclaimed, and uh, none who heard your words. He's appealing to the power of predictive prophecy. In Isaiah 42 and verse 8, I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Isaiah would have none of the idolatry of the nations because uh, the idols were not deserving of glory or of praise. They were not God at all. They were just figures. Um, they were false gods. Um, so God has a high estimation of the power of prophecy. Look at another one in Isaiah 44, verses 6 through 8. Um, in these passages, God challenges the idols to declare things that are to come in order to prove that they're gods, and, and God claims he knows the end from the beginning. So take a look at this, verse 6. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God who is like me. Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set it before me since I appointed an ancient people. Let them declare what is to come and what will happen. God knows what is to come. But these false prophets, these idols, they, they could not predict what was to come. So Isaiah is challenging them to do what God can do. Prophecy was one of the unique um, things that, that proved that a prophet was legitimate and that he was speaking from God. Um, he goes on to say, Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? There is no rock. I know not any. Um, so this speaks of the folly of idolatry and the veracity of God as he speaks through his prophets. Um, one of the other passages that perhaps you're more familiar with would be Deuteronomy 18 
verses 18 through 22. And in this passage, you, you find the test of a true prophet or a false prophet. So Deuteronomy 18, verse 18 says, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. So Moses is being spoken to here. And I will put my words in his mouth. He shall speak to them all that I command him. Whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. Now that's a prophecy clearly about Jesus, who was the prophet like Moses, the prophet who was to come. Um, this prophecy is identified as referring to Jesus in passages like Acts chapter 3, where um, Peter and, and, and John um, actually refer to it both in other passages uh, where Jesus is the prophet like Moses who is to come. But then you get to verse 20, and you begin to see kind of a rule that's laid down about the difference between a true prophet and a, and a false prophet. Verse 20 says this, The prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. Someone who was claiming that they were speaking God's word when they weren't, there were serious consequences in the Old Testament to that. Death was the consequence. You claim you're telling people God's truth and you're not, that prophet shall die. If you say in your heart, how may we know the word that the Lord has not spoken? How do we determine whether somebody's telling us the truth or not? Well, he says in verse 22, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. If the prophet predicts something, it doesn't happen. And all it takes is one thing that he's predicted and claimed that it's from God. If it doesn't happen, then God hasn't spoken by him and he's a false prophet. And the sentence is death for a false prophet. The prophet, it says, has spoken it presumptuously. Not only that, you need not be afraid of him. Don't trust him is the idea. So, so prophecy not only validates the foreknowledge of God, it separates him from false gods and validates the prophet's message. The fulfillment of prophecy is the acid test of a true prophet. Now, how's that important for us today? Well, I'll give you just a couple of quick examples. You know, the Jehovah's Witnesses have predicted the coming of Jesus multiple times. 1921, 1925, they said Jesus was going to return in 1975. They said the same thing in 1981, multiple times. All it takes is for a religious organization to say that Jesus is going to come back at a certain day or time or year and it not happen. And do you know what you learn from that? Don't trust that organization. They're lying. They're false prophets and false teachers. Harold Camping, you remember him a few years ago? This is a little more recent. You know, you'd have to look up documents about the Jehovah's Witnesses making these types of predictions, um, but it's, it's certainly out there for people to see. And maybe we're, we're not as familiar with it because it's been several years since they've, they've learned their lesson to be careful about those predictions. Harold Camping predicted that Jesus was going to return, and he predicted a specific date and a specific time about when it was going to be. Did you, you, we're still here. He didn't return on that day and time. There's people still following Harold Camping. I, why? You speak, and you claim that the Lord is speaking through you, and you make a prophecy like that, and you're wrong. You're a false prophet, and you need to stop listening to him at that point. Um, you've only got to be wrong once before you're a false prophet. Um, prophecy is powerful. It helps us to see who might be legitimate prophets, certainly in Scripture, and it helps us to expose false prophets when it doesn't happen. Let me give you three examples of the power of prophecy. We'll start with an Old Testament example. Turn your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 28. Jeremiah chapter 28. We're just going to read this chapter, but in this chapter you see the distinction between a true prophet and a false prophet. So Jeremiah chapter 28. In Jeremiah chapter 28, it happened in the same year at the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the fourth year in the fifth month, 
that Hananiah, the son of Azur, the prophet, who is from Gibeon, spoke to me in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the priests and of all the people. So here's Hananiah, and he is speaking to Jeremiah. And he's there in the presence of the priests and of all the people. And here's what he said. Hananiah says, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Now, if you're being oppressed by Babylon, this is the kind of news you want to hear. You want to hear that uh, I've broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Israel is going to be released from captivity. We're going to get to go home. Um, We're going to have our freedom again. Within two full years, notice verse 3, Hananiah says, Within two full years, I will bring back to this place all the vessels of the Lord's house. That's good news. Remember, the Babylonians had taken the vessels from the temple. They had taken them to Babylonia. In fact, in the book of Daniel, it says that they got drunk one night. They were kind of drinking, actually, alcohol out of the vessels they had taken from the temple, which was certainly insulting to the Jews. But Hananiah says there's good news. Within two years, we're going to get to go back, and uh, all the vessels of the Lord's house are going to be returned that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place and carried to Babylon. That's the kind of news you want to hear. I will bring back to this place Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, with all the captives of Judah who went to Babylon. For I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. That's one of the scary things about prophecy, too. Sometimes we want something to be true so badly that we hope this person's telling us the truth. They're giving us false comfort. And Hananiah is giving false comfort. In verse 5, it says, Then the prophet Jeremiah, who's the real prophet here. I'm just going to go ahead and jump ahead to the ending. Hananiah is the false prophet. Jeremiah is the true prophet. And the prophet Jeremiah spoke to the prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priests and in the presence of all the people who stood in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. That doesn't mean... By the way, Jeremiah agreed with Hananiah. Amen means so be it. When you say amen at the end of a prayer, you're saying so be it. When you say amen in the sermon, so be it. So Jeremiah says, so be it. You know, it's like, I I hope you're right. I think he's being a little sarcastic, actually. A little tongue-in-cheek action going on here. He says, the Lord do so. The Lord perform your words which you have prophesied to bring back the vessels of the Lord's house and all who were carried away captive from Babylon to this place. But then he has this next word, verse 7, nevertheless. You know, Hannah and I, I'm hearing what you're saying. I really hope you're right. Nevertheless, hear now this word that I speak in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people. The prophets who have been before me and before you of old prophesied against many countries and great kingdoms of war and disaster and pestilence. As for the prophet who prophesies of peace, when the word of the prophet comes to pass, the prophet will be known as one whom the Lord has truly sent. So in other words, I think Jeremiah is making a subtle point to, you know, two years from now, I guess we're going to see whether or not God really was speaking through you right here, Hananiah. Then Hananiah, so Hananiah feels a little insulted by this because they're in front of all the priests and all the people and Jeremiah is kind of putting down Hananiah's prophecy. So Hananiah wants to make a big show out of this and Hananiah the prophet took the yoke off the prophet Jeremiah's neck and and broke it. I don't know if he used his knee. I'm thinking Bo Jackson broke it, you know, that kind of kind of breaking the bat over his knee action. But he takes the yoke off Jeremiah's neck, breaks it. And Hananiah spoke in the presence of all the people, saying, Thus says the Lord, Even so I will break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, from the neck of all nations within the space of two full years. And the prophet Jeremiah went his way. So Hananiah sticks to his guns. Now the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah after Hananiah had broke the prophet had broken the yoke from the neck of the prophet Jeremiah, saying, verse 13, Go and tell Hananiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, You have broken the yokes of wood, 
but you have made in their place yokes of iron. Can you break an iron yoke over your knee? No. God is saying, essentially, that you think that within two full years, you're just going to break free of this captivity. I'm telling you, you can't break this captivity because I've, I've set it in place. Verse 14, For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have put a yoke of iron on the neck of all these nations, that they may serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and they shall serve him. I have given him the beasts of the field also. Then the prophet Jeremiah said to Hananiah the prophet, Hear now, Hananiah, the Lord has not sent you. You make this people trust in a lie. You're giving them false comfort and false hope. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will cast you from the face of the earth, and this year you shall die. Because you have taught rebellion against the Lord. What's verse 17 say? So Hananiah the prophet died the same year in the seventh month. Which one was the true prophet? Jeremiah. What Jeremiah spoke came to pass. What Hananiah spoke about this, you're going to be out of captivity in two years? No. They were in it for 70 solid. Because that's what God had originally predicted, and that's what was going to happen regardless of what Hananiah brought forth. Also, a true prophet is not going to teach something that contradicts with what God had already spoken. God had already spoken how long that captivity and exile was going to be. That's one of the points that Jeremiah made. There have been prophets before you that said this, and while I hope you're right, you're wrong. All right? Jeremiah is a good example of a true prophet. True prophet, what he says, it happens. Comes to pass. Hananiah was a false prophet. It didn't happen. And so he was exposed as false right there. Jesus is an example of uh, someone who used the power of prophecy. When people question Jesus about, you know, who gave you the authority to do these things? Um, why is it that you think you can claim that you are the Son of God? Well, verse 39 of John 5, he said, You search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. These are they which testify of me. Read the prophecies, is what Jesus was saying. They will predict the Messiah who was to come. And I'm doing the things the Messiah who was to come was supposed to be doing. In verse 46, if you believe Moses, you would believe me. He wrote about me. Jesus is appealing to the power of prophecy. And we're going to have a lesson on messianic prophecy as one of those prophecies um, that, that helps us to understand there's a divine intellect behind the Word of God. The apostles also used prophecy. In Acts 2, um, when Peter is preaching Jesus for the first time, in verse 16, who does he appeal to in Acts chapter 2 and verse 16? Well, if you Look at that sermon. Verse 16 says, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. You want to know what's going on here with this baptism of the Holy Spirit and people speaking in different tongues? He says, what's going on here is what Joel predicted was going to happen when the Lord came. The Lord has come. And the fact that we're speaking by the power of the Spirit and you're hearing um, the gospel in your own language from fishermen who have never learned it before, it's evidence that the Spirit has been outpoured upon the people, and it's evidence that the prophecy of Joel has been fulfilled. Then he goes on to another prophecy. He looks at David's prophecy, and he talks about how David looked ahead to uh, the resurrection of Jesus, that, that the Messiah would not be left in, in Sheol. He would not be left in, in Hades. He would not see corruption uh, so he looks ahead to the resurrection and then also the exaltation of Jesus as you look further. Fulfilled prophecy was often used to prove that Jesus was the Christ. So there is an appeal to prophecy by the authors of Scripture and the preachers and proclaimers of the gospel. Um, in 2 Peter chapter 1, and verse 19, this is what Peter says, We have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this, first of all, that no 
prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. Men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Um, this is Peter looking at how Jesus was the fulfillment of prophecy and that what they saw in Jesus uh, was the fulfillment of things that had been predicted. Um, here's the neat thing about prophecy. As we see it fulfilled, it becomes more powerful than when it was originally spoken. The force of the argument is constantly growing. Uh, I want you to, t to think about to think about this maybe in, in an illustration. Let's suppose for a moment the college basketball season hasn't even begun yet. Let's suppose for a moment that um, I made a specific prediction about the NCAA tournament, which is going to happen in 2023. You know, in most years, I fill out a bracket just like a lot of people do. But let's imagine in this coming year, I tell you that God has spoken to me about every single pick in the upcoming NCAA tournament, and I'm going to write down the names of all 68 teams and their seeds from the tournament field. Now, if I say Purdue's the champion, you already know I'm a false prophet. I just want to say that to Russ. I just, I just want to get Russell going. He's, he's nodding off a little bit on me. So, <laughs> But let's say I'm going to pick correctly every game from those 68 teams going all the way from the play-in games, the round of 64, the round of 32, the Sweet 16, the Elite Eight, the Final Four, all the way down the championship game. Um. Do you know what the odds, by the way, of picking every single team correctly for that bracket is? One in 9.2 quintillion. It's pretty bad odds. That's why it doesn't happen. Now, most people would say, you know, yeah, right, nobody picks a perfect bracket. But think about it. If I was to make those specific predictions right now, even before the season started, claiming that they were prophecies from God, you'd probably be thinking, well, We'll see. We'll see what the tournament field looks like in March of next year. And most people would probably just ignore me, think that I'm a lunatic and crazy, and I'm just blowing smoke. But what if March comes, and we get to that round of 64, down to the 32, down to the Sweet 16, and I show you my bracket, and I'm like, perfect. Perfect bracket. I didn't even, I didn't even know who was going to be in the tournament back in September, and I'm perfect. I knew every spot and slot that they were going to be in. Do you think people start listening to me? They would. In, in fact, people who have nearly perfect brackets, I mean, they're doing news interviews with them during March Madness because there's a lot of value in having a perfect bracket. Come to Elite Eight and then the Final Four, I had every team correct. Do you think national media would start listening to this story? If I picked the perfect bracket before the field was announced, do you think my prophetic message would be taken just a little bit more seriously by the skeptics? I think so. Now, here's the thing. We're not talking about NCAA brackets in the Bible. We're talking about certain cases in the scriptures when God said certain cities would be rebuilt or a nation would never reign over others again. Many specific examples we're going to study in some of our next Sunday night evening evidences lessons. Now what I want you to see is that these cases of fulfilled prophecy, when you compile them and consider them in specificity, they are more powerful today as we look back into history than when they were first uttered and probably received by a very skeptical audience. And that, I think, is the point that Peter makes here in 2 Peter chapter 1, 19 through 21. A miracle? That's pretty impressive to people who see it. But not everybody's witnessed miracles. Prophecy should be even more impressive to us. It's being demonstrated before our very eyes. And that's what Peter's contrasting in 2 Peter chapter 1. In verse 16, he referred to the eyewitness testimony of the miracle-bringing Son of God. But in verse 19... He says that this eyewitness testimony only confirms more fully what the prophets had said about the coming Christ long ago. 
William Paley once wrote in Evidences of Christianity that the sense of verse 19 is this, that we have the word of prophecy more sure, that is, made by the fulfillment of it more clear than when we uttered. And the point is this, prophecy is not something we should view as just a bunch of Old Testament verses for the ancient people of Israel with no relevance for us at all today. Prophecy is more relevant today because we can look back in history, we can see the documented fulfillment of it in several cases. And that's what we're going to do. Um, Hopkins says this, I'm going to give you two quotes, and then I'm actually going to preview with you some of the lessons we'll have in the future. But Hopkins wrote, wrote in Evidences of Christianity, miracle and prophecy, those two grand pillars of Christian evidence are neither of them even claimed by Mohammedanism. Muhammad can't point to prophecies that he's predicted in the future. Neither of them are the ground on which it has been attempted to introduce any other religion. Christianity is truly unique because of the prophecies that are fulfilled. And then Bernard Ram says this in Protestant Christian Evidences. He says, one real case of fulfilled prophecy would establish a supernatural act. But if our interpretation of the prophetic passages be correct, there are great numbers of them. One unequivocal miracle, one indubitable fulfilled prophecy would show the fallacy of naturalism for the causal web of the universe would be ruptured at that point through which the supernatural is intruded. And therefore, radical doubt must be certain that it has silenced the testimony of all prophecies, whereas the Christian asserts that rather than resting our case upon one prophecy, we have dozens of prophecies at our beck and call. Some of the ones we're going to look at in upcoming lessons in October, we're going to look at Israel and prophecy and specific prophecies that pertain to Israel. In November 6th, in that lesson, we're going to think about Egypt in prophecy, specific prophecies made about Egypt that we know have been fulfilled as we look at history. We're going to look at Tyre and Sidon in prophecy in our December lesson, and then on New Year's Day, we're going to think about Babylon in prophecy. All of these are um, I think pretty interesting lessons. If you like prophecy and then you like history attached to prophecy, I think you'll find them to be pretty interesting. And then we're going to start studying about Jesus next year, if the Lord wills, and thinking about why he's the Son of God. And one of those lessons will be about the prophecies that point to the Messiah, as well as many other evidences. Um, each of these lessons give additional proof that we can trust the witness of the prophets in Scripture and therefore, we can trust the scriptures and impress upon our minds our need to fear God and his every warning and trust his every promise. Um, and so I want to conclude today. And I want to just simply tell you this as we conclude. The God of the Bible is called also the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He was there at the beginning. He knows the end too. And Jesus, who is the very image of God on earth, also had that power to prophesy. He called his own shot while he was here on earth and promised that after three days he would rise from the dead. And he did exactly that, as written down by many eyewitnesses. And this same Jesus tells us that a day is coming when he's going to return and he's going to judge the world. That's a prophecy. Jesus is going to return. He's going to judge the world. We are going to stand before him in judgment. That's a prophecy. This same Jesus is going to be our judge. And so if God's word is going to be the standard of your judgment and you are going to stand before him, the question you should be asking is, have you obeyed it? 